Happy Wednesday! You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. This week on Mama Murdered a Podcast, we'll be covering part two of Candy Montgomery. And since this is a part two episode, I would highly encourage you to go backwards and find part one. There's going to be a lot of stuff that you missed if you're just jumping into the part two episode. In part one, we discussed how Candy and a man from church named Alan Gore decided to have a pretty meticulously planned out affair. And this week, we'll get into the murder of Alan's wife, who was murdered by none other than Alan's former secret lover, Candy. And since we are all here for one thing, one thing only, let's get it. When we finished part one, I was saying that both couples seemed to be going back to what would be considered a normal relationship for them. And Alan was having to leave Betty for a business trip, and he left his house on Friday, June 13th, 1980, not knowing that he would never see his wife and 11-month-old daughter Bethany again. As Alan headed for the airport, he watched his wife and baby daughter wave goodbye in his rearview mirror. Betty had always gotten pretty emotional when Alan did have to leave to go out of town, and this time was no different, except for the fact that Betty's period was two weeks late and she was worried that she may be pregnant again. They had just had their second daughter, Bethany, and she was only 11 months old. Betty didn't feel like she could handle a third kid all by herself with Alan being gone all the time, most of the part of the day at work, and the other part he spent at church, volunteering for different activities, and basically just making sure that he was gone and not at home for the most part of the day. Betty had even gone so far as to take a medication to induce her menstrual cycle. The medications hadn't exactly done their job just yet, so there was really no way to know for sure if she may be pregnant or not yet. Alan hadn't gotten the chance to tell their oldest daughter, Elisa, goodbye because she had slept over at Pat and Candy Montgomery's house the night before. And Candy had pretty big plans for the kids that day, and those plans would take up the most part of the day. Candy was taking all three of the kids to the last day of the vacation Bible school at their church, and she was planning to watch the kids do a puppet show that they had been prepping for all week. They were going to eat lunch there, and the entire family had big plans for the evening as well. Candy and her husband Pat had both agreed to let Alyssa stay another night with them so that they could tag along for their day of adventures because Pat and Candy had planned to take the girls to see the Emperor Strikes Back Star Wars movie that was newly released in the theaters and wasn't available on VHS yet. And Alyssa had basically begged Candy and Pat to let her go to the movies with them, so basically they just needed to get the okay from Alyssa's mom Betty to make sure that it was okay with her as well. Candy had agreed to let Alyssa spend another night with her daughter Jenny, but Candy still had to check with Betty to make sure that it was okay with her, because normally, neither family allowed sleepovers to happen two nights in a row. If Betty agreed to a second night sleepover, then Candy knew that she would have to pick up Alyssa's bathing suit from Betty and Alan's house in Wiley, Texas, which wasn't too far, but Candy already had a ton of other errands to run on this particular day, and since Candy had already agreed to another sleepover at her house, that meant that if Betty agreed that she was going to be the one now responsible for taking Alyssa to her swim practice that day. Alyssa's swim meet was also in Wiley, Texas, also just adding to the more errands that she already had to run. She would just need to swing by the Gore's house and make sure that the plans were okay with Betty. It was Friday the 13th, and it was the last day of vacation Bible school at the United Methodist Church of Lucas, Texas, where the Montgomery family and the Gore family both attended services regularly. Candy was a volunteer for most church activities, and the vacation Bible school was no different. Candy pulled up to the church with her daughter Jenny, Jenny's best friend Alyssa, and her son Ian around 9 a.m. After breakfast and on the way to church, Candy realized that she still had to figure out how to make it to Allen, Texas to get gas for her station wagon, and then she had to swing by the church to help make lunch for the Vacation Bible School graduates, which was in Lucas, Texas, also still having to make it to the Target in Plano to grab Father's Day cards. Candy also had to run by her best friend Sherry's house to drop off a foldable table because Sherry's family was coming in from out of town, and she had asked Candy to borrow the table. But Sherry's house was in Fairview, Texas, so Candy had to be everywhere with only one car, two hands, and an extra kid to do it all with. Candy's first stop would be to the church to catch Reverend Ron up on a few things that she had been in charge of taking care of. 
Then Candy spoke to a few of the women that were helping set up everything for the final day of Vacation Bible School when Candy told a church friend named Barbara that she was going to have to run to Betty Gore's house to make sure that her daughter Alyssa could spend another night again so that Alyssa would be able to go with them to see the movie that evening. And while she was there, she also had to grab Alyssa's bathing suit if Betty said that she would be able to stay. Candy also told Barbara that she was going to try to run by the Target store in Plano and go ahead and pick up the Father's Day cards that she needed while she was already out and about. And that's when Candy's friend Barbara reminded her that the puppet show was set to start at 11 a.m. later that afternoon. And Candy just reassured her that she would be back in time for the puppet show, that she wouldn't miss it, and that she wouldn't be gone longer than an hour at most. Barbara and a few of the other moms were going to help look after Candy's son, Ian, her daughter, Jenny, and Betty and Alan's daughter, Alyssa, while Candy ran at these few errands. Candy told the kids to behave and mind their manners while she ran these few errands to try to knock some of the things off of her to-do list. Candy left the church to head to the Gore's house to make sure that Betty was okay with the plans that Alyssa had made, kind of without asking. And after Candy knocked on the door and was invited inside, We'll never actually know how this conversation got escalated to murder. We'll never know what was said or even who initiated the argument to start with. But something happened or something was said because Candy got Alyssa's bathing suit and even a few peppermints because Alyssa would only go under the water if her mom Betty gave her a peppermint to hold in her mouth while she was under. So Candy had gotten the peppermints to take to the swim class with her and Alyssa's bathing suit. And supposedly she had even gotten the okay for Alyssa to spend another night with her and Pat. But by the time that Candy walked out of the front door to leave the Gore's house that morning, Betty was laying dead inside of her own house, leaving her 11-month-old daughter Bethany alone in her crib. And whatever did happen inside this house on Friday the 13th will always be one-sided. Because Betty isn't able to tell her side of the truth, Bethany was too small to remember what was happening and going on. But somehow, Candy still gets to speak her truth. When Candy walked out of the front door of Betty Gore's house that morning, she knew that 11-month-old Bethany would be inside alone. She was actually thinking that Alan would be home from work that evening and that he would be there to attend to Bethany's needs. But that still begs the question, why did Candy think it was okay to leave Bethany alone in her crib for multiple, multiple hours alone. What does that even say about Candy? Because we know that Candy got to the church about 9 or 9.30, dropped the kids off, talked to a friend, presumably got to Betty's house between 9.30 and 10.30, maybe even a little earlier. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and assume that a 1980s husband probably would get home between 5.30 and 6, maybe even 5 and 6 o'clock. So that still leaves nine to even five. That is a literal eight-hour shift at work that she left an 11-month-old baby home alone. And she has two kids of her own. It's not like she doesn't have a mother's intuition or a motherly instinct. She knows that you can't leave a almost one-year-old alone like that. Yet she did. So what does Candy say happened? Well, according to Candy... During the visit to ask Betty if Alyssa could spend another night, Betty finally confronted Candy about the affair between her and Alan. Candy said that she did admit to Betty that they had been having an affair, but that it had been over for about seven months now and that they didn't love each other. It was strictly sex. She told Betty there was nothing to worry about, that it had been over, and that when Candy apologized to Betty for telling her that she never meant to hurt her, Betty just lost her shit and grabbed a three-foot axe out of a storage room, and while Candy was telling Betty all of this, that Betty lifted the axe over her head and swung it at Candy, but that Candy was able to duck and dodge and had time to move in between the swing of the axe, but that the axe did graze her foot, causing a pretty gnarly injury to Candy's foot. Candy says after this that she tried to get the axe out of Betty's hands, but she knew that she was going to have to fight off a raging Betty first. Candy says that she was able to grab the axe, and when Betty lunged for it, that Candy pushed the axe towards Betty, causing her to fall backwards. And as Betty crawled up on all fours, trying to stand back up, Candy realized that Betty just wasn't going to stop, that she wasn't just going to let Candy leave. So Candy swung the axe, hitting Betty in the back of the head. Candy even says that she heard the noise of Betty's skull being cracked by the axe. 
Candy says that she dropped the axe and that that's when Betty grabbed the axe that Candy had just thrown down and was trying to block Candy from leaving. The struggle continued like this for minutes. When Candy told Betty that she didn't have to do this, Betty simply held her pointer finger up to her lips and let out a long shh. This shushing noise that Betty had just made was exactly what caused Candy to snap. This shushing noise had triggered Candy and taken her back to a time in her childhood when her mother had shushed her in an emergency room when Candy was really young and crying from an injury. That Candy's mom had shushed her and then asked her what the people in the waiting room would think, which is where Candy learned the what people think of you is more important than how you're feeling thing. And with this, Candy was able to get the axe away from Betty and she swung the three-foot axe more than a dozen times at Betty. And since she was still filled with rage and anger after the first dozen swings, that she just kept swinging. As Candy backed away from Betty's unrecognizable face, she slowly realized that the entire area surrounding Betty was covered in blood. Betty's blood. Candy went to Betty's bathroom to wash her arms off, and she fumbled through the closets and pantries to try to find some towels. Candy tried to clean up the blood. But with every wipe, the blood just seemed to smear, making the puddles appear larger than they already had been. Candy still tried, and she wiped and wiped and wiped. She could smell the fabric softener that the towels had been washed in radiating up through her nostrils, and it made her feel super nauseous. Candy realized that the blood wasn't going to be cleaned up quickly or easily, and she had other things to do. She still had to make it back to the church, and she still had to get Father's Day cards, of course and a slew of other things that she needed to do before she met Pat at the movies that evening. So as Candy gathered her things from Betty's house, she walked out of the front door, leaving an 11-month-old Bethany alone in her crib with her dead mother in the next room. Candy drove all the way back to her house to clean up and change her clothes before she went back to church because God don't like bloody people. Once she got home, she realized that she must have gotten her watch wet when she rinsed her hands off at Betty's house, so now she had no way of knowing what time it was. When she realized she had gotten her watch wet and it must have stopped, this must have been when she thought up the most perfect alibi that she would tell anybody at church who asked why she had taken her so long. And Candy had to have rehearsed this story in her head a dozen times on the drive back to her house to change clothes and clean up the remaining blood that was still on her. Candy went home and took a shower while she waited on the shirt that she was wearing at church earlier that day to wash and dry, you know, so that she would still be wearing the same clothes that she had been wearing that morning. Candy then matched the same shade of blue jeans that she had been wearing earlier with a different pair that she had and slipped those on. But her foot still had a pretty good gash on it and people would surely notice that. So instead of her rubber flip-flops that she was known for wearing in the summer, Candy slipped on a canvas-type sneaker, I'm thinking maybe like Keds or Vans, and she headed back to church. When Candy got back inside the church, she had been gone so long that she did end up missing the puppet show that the kids had been practicing all week and had finally got to put on. When somebody said something about Candy missing the puppet show, she told the alibi that she had been practicing in her head since she left Betty's house. Well, I just went to Betty's and we got to talking, and when I left, I thought I still had time to go to Target and get Father's Day cards in Plano, so I drove all the way to the Plano Target, but when I got there, I realized my watch had stopped working, so I didn't even go inside. I just drove right back here. I didn't even go in. And Candy told this same story almost verbatim every time she spoke to anyone that questioned her actions that day. And since Alan had already left for his business trip out of town, he always made sure to call Betty from the airport. And again, when he got to his room, this was his way of trying to talk Betty's anxiety down some. He knew that it helped her, so he did it. But he called this time from the airport, and he got no response, which was weird, but not alarming. Candy met Pat when he got off of work in the parking lot at the movie theater, and as she waited for Pat to arrive, she heard Betty and Alan's daughter Alyssa say something about her little sister Bethany. And just the mere mention of Bethany's name brought everything rushing back to Candy. All of a sudden, she could smell the cleaning chemicals that she had tried to use to clean the bloody mess up inside of Betty's house. She could smell the laundry soap that she had used to wash her shirt with earlier. And she was just washed with a relief when she realized that Alan would be home soon, that Bethany wouldn't be alone in her crib anymore. But Alan wasn't coming home from work on this day. Candy just didn't know it yet. 
Candy wasn't aware that Alan would be out of town on a business trip. She had just assumed that he would be home around dinner time like normal, you know, and find his dead wife and Bethany alone in her crib. Either way, though, Candy had still knowingly left Bethany in her crib for hours and hours alone, and she was just kind of okay with that. She was also okay with Alan coming in from work and finding his wife axed to death. She obviously wasn't too worried about that problem either, though. Alan was still trying his luck on the landline to reach Buddy at their home, but he still wasn't having any luck, and with every call that Alan made that went unanswered, he started to get a little more worried about his wife. And as the time started to progress, he got more worried with each missed call. And at first, Alan just kind of assumed that Betty was busy with Bethany, that she'd call him back when she got a chance. She had also been suffering from the depression, like I said, and she was having a hard time coping with Alan being gone for even a short few days on a business trip. She hated it. So Alan had tried to cut back on his traveling for work, but sometimes he didn't have much of a choice and he was forced to go out of town. And I mean, it was how they paid their bills. So, I mean, you know, what other option did he have really? But sadly, none of those calls would go answered. The more that Alan had tried to call Betty, the more panicked that he got when she wasn't answering. Betty had missed multiple calls from Alan at this point. And, you know, at first he's thinking, oh, she's busy with the baby. But as the time gets a little later into the evening and it starts getting dark outside, Alan knows his wife better than anybody else. He knew that Betty didn't have many friends and that she didn't even like leaving the house when Alan was home with her at dark. She definitely wasn't going to go outside in the dark and run errands with him going out, out of town. It just wasn't an option. Meanwhile, Candy and Pat had taken Betty and Alan's daughter Alyssa, their daughter Jenny, and their son Ian to see the new Star Wars movie. And during some of the fighting scenes in the movie and the blood scenes, Candy was rushed with these smells and feelings, making her feel like she was still inside of Betty's house. Candy would take any reason to get up and leave the theater, so every time one of the kids needed a bathroom break, they needed more soda or a popcorn fill-up, Candy was the one offering to take them to the restroom or get whatever they needed. She had been trying to stay busy and keep her mind occupied, but that wasn't going to stop her from remembering what had just happened earlier that day and what she had actually done. So sitting in silence at a movie theater was not helping with the thoughts that she just kept having. The thoughts that were taking her right back to that bloody scene of Betty and she was just trying to forget it. After the movie was over, Candy and Pat, along with all three of the kids, had decided to grab tacos for dinner and take them home to eat. While Pat was finishing up with his dinner after his jog, Alan called the Montgomery house. And mind you, at this point, Pat knows about the affair with Alan and Candy, so why is Alan calling their house? But when Candy answered the phone and he asked if she had spoken to Betty at any point throughout the day, Candy just said that she had been by their house earlier to get Alyssa's swimsuit and that Betty seemed fine when she left. Which, that's a lie. <laughs> Alan told Candy that Betty had missed multiple calls and that he was starting to get pretty worried about her. Candy even went so far as to offer to ride to Betty and Alan's house to check on Betty. Alan assured her that that wasn't necessary, that he sure it was fine, and that he would just call a neighbor to go over and check on Betty to make sure that she was okay. Candy said okay and told Alan that if he changed his mind or if he needed anything else just to give her a call. And she's just so helpful. <laughs> which at this point, I feel like we all know Candy, and she's just always there to help. So Candy's husband, Pat, was kind of puzzled, and he's wondering why Alan was even calling their house, especially since Pat knew that Alan had been sleeping with Candy just a few months before this. Candy simply explained to Pat that Alan couldn't get a hold of Betty and that he was starting to worry about her. She told Pat that Alan had already called multiple times and that there was no answer at their house, and that he had decided to call Candy and Pat's house just to see if, you know, they knew anything or if they had heard from her. And Pat agreed that it was weird that Betty wouldn't answer the phone, but he didn't really think much more about it. And, I mean, honestly, why would he? Alan's co-workers were aware that his wife Betty had not been answering the phone that day, but Alan was getting pretty tired of explaining that Betty didn't have any friends and that she would never leave the house after dark just because of her anxiety alone. Uh, not mentioning the fact that she would never leave the house alone without him being there. So he had basically just gotten to the point where he was telling his co-workers that, yes, Betty was probably fine, that he was probably overreacting, and that everything would probably be okay. 
And on these business trips, Alan was kind of obligated to go to dinner with the co-workers, even though he could feel in his gut that something was very much wrong at home. And eventually, Alan did have to go to dinner with the co-workers, and the only thing that he ordered was a cheesecake. And while Alan was at this dinner, he made sure to let everybody at the hotel staff that he was staying at know to forward all of his calls to the hotel restaurant where they would be. And most of the staff agreed to this before seating Alan with his co-workers for dinner. Alan did not even touch his cheesecake, which, where I come from, is basically a crime in itself. After Alan sat at this dinner and made small talk with his co-workers for a little while, he finally excused himself from dinner early just to be able to go back to his hotel room and wait for Betty to either call him back or to wait on her to get an answer from their landline phone. And after numerous more calls, Alan eventually just called a neighbor named Richard that lived by their house. And when Alan called Richard, he asked him to go over to his house and just check and see if Betty's car was still home. And if it was, to knock on the door just to make sure that she was okay. And if she was okay, just to please have Betty call him. Richard explained that he was home alone with his kids because his wife was at a bridge game. That he would walk over and he would let him know something shortly. And honestly, Alan thought that maybe the baby Bethany had maybe gotten sick. Or maybe either Bethany or Betty were hurt inside of his house. And since he knew that Alyssa had stayed another night with Candy and Pat, he just assumed that it either had to be Betty or Bethany that something was wrong with. He could just feel that something was wrong either way. He just didn't know what, and he just knew that something wasn't right, and he was basically just ready to get to the bottom of this feeling that he had. Alan had absolutely no way of knowing that by the time he made the call to his neighbor Richard, that his 11-month-old daughter Bethany had been crying and alone in her crib for 13 hours already. She was covered in her own urine and her own feces. When the neighbor got to Alan's house and they finally called him back, Richard let Alan know that he thought something was very much wrong too. Richard told Alan that all of the lights inside the house were on, but that Betty's car wasn't in the garage, so she must have been out, which was kind of a sigh of relief and also a sign that something was wrong with Betty or Bethany either way. Alan thanked Richard for his time, and he hung up the phone. But after a while of uh, more unanswered calls, Alan started calling around to local hospitals and even local jails to see if Betty was there, even though that was a very unlikely option. He was willing to try anything at this point. With no luck at the hospitals or the jails, Alan reluctantly called Richard again and asked him to go check one more time just to see if maybe Betty had gotten home now. But this time when Richard walked back to the Gore's house and looked inside of their garage window again, he did notice that Betty's car had been pulled up pretty far into the garage and that he'd likely just not seen it before when he was there. It was really dark outside and there wasn't a whole lot of light in the garage. So this time, while Richard is trying to explain to Alan what he saw when he walked over to their house, he kind of agreed that something had to have been wrong, especially being that both cars were home and that they had both been home earlier that night and he just hadn't noticed, and also the fact that all of the lights inside were on, yet no one would answer the door when he knocked, this time or the time before. So once Alan knew that he wasn't overreacting, he told Richard to get inside of his house any way that he could. Alan didn't care if he had to break a window. He didn't care if he had to bust the front door down. He did not care if Richard had to blow the house up. He ordered Richard to get inside of his house and find out what was wrong with his wife as soon as possible. Luckily for Alan, Richard was actually the same realtor that had sold Alan and Betty their house originally when they bought it. So, Alan grabbed his huge ring of keys, thinking that he may still have a key to get inside their house, as he walked over to the Gore's house again. When Richard got to Alan and Betty's front yard, he was met by two of their other neighbors. Alan had called a second neighbor by the name of Jerry, and Alan had asked Jerry to meet Richard at his house to help go inside and see what they could find. Jerry, of course, agreed, but he could hear the fear in Alan's voice. And with that being said... Jerry's wife wasn't so keen on this idea that he would go into this house alone that was potentially dangerous by himself. So Jerry's wife called a third neighbor by the name of Lester. 
Jerry's wife had just basically asked Lester if he would walk over to the Gorse house with Jerry, and Lester agreed, of course. So now there are three men meeting up with one another in Betty and Allen's front yard. (laughs) It's a block party, basically. And as all three of the men looked through a few different windows, they also looked in the garage door windows, and Richard walked to the front door to see if the key that he had that may still work for their door would work, he immediately knew something was very wrong when he turned the doorknob and the front door was unlocked and swung itself open. All three men were a bit more nervous now, especially since the front door was already unlocked. As the front door swung itself open, the three men could hear a very low crying noise from one of the back bedrooms. When they went inside of the room, they saw baby Bethany, who had been in that room so long by herself that she had completely cried herself hoarse. Bethany was covered in her own urine and feces and had clearly been left unattended in her crib for hours upon hours upon hours, but luckily she was unharmed. One of the men took Bethany to his wife so that she could get her cleaned up, get her fed, and check her out while he went back to the Gore's house to call the police. And while all three of the men were pretty worried about getting the baby situated and taken care of, This also just furthered their belief that something was very much wrong with Betty. The three men walked around each room in the house, and when they got to a small utility closet, Lester reached for the door handle and opened the door. As he pushed the door open, all he could see was that Betty was very obviously dead, and there there were what seemed to be like gallons of blood surrounding her body. When Lester saw this, he just shut the door and told Jerry and Richard not to even go inside of that utility closet. And as Lester was pulling the door to the utility closet back shut, the Gore's landline phone rang again. Jerry answered the phone, and it was Alan coming to see what was going on or what they had found. Jerry explained to Alan that Bethany was okay, but that it had looked like Betty had been shot by what he presumed to be a shotgun. With Betty's depression always looming over her, I think some of the men just kind of assumed that it may have been a suicide. A suicide by gunshot seemed to be the only logical explanation for the condition of Betty's face and body. But Alan was very much sure that they did not own a gun of any kind. There would not have been a gun in their house for her to use to commit suicide which was also a little alarming to Alan. Jerry told Alan that he needed to get home as soon as he possibly could and that he was going to hang up with him now so that he could call the police. Alan thanked Jerry and told him that he would be home as soon as he could catch a flight. With all of the madness going on, Alan called the first person that he could think of in his time of grief. He called Candy at home, again to give her the news of Betty's death. Alan asked Candy if Alyssa could stay at their house for a few more days so that he could make sure the house was okay for Alyssa to come home to. Alan's flight landed and he immediately drove home to where his wife had been murdered. When Alan finally got back to his house, the police and investigators had to let Alan know that Betty hadn't actually been shot, that she had instead been literally axed to death. Alan nearly fainted hearing the news and this information And while Alan was finding all of this out, the neighbors were all outside of his house, listening to all of this, of course, it's a small town. So one of the lovely ladies that helped keep the phone tree rumor mill up and running decided to call Candy and let her know that Betty hadn't actually committed suicide, that she had been murdered by an axe. And while Candy was on the phone with the rumor mill CEO, She was actually in the middle of cutting up her rubber flip-flops to throw them away to get rid of any evidence that may still be left on them from the murder that she was actually responsible for. Because remember, Candy found some of the same shade of blue jeans that she had been wearing before and even washed the same shirt that she'd been wearing so that she would have on the same clothes when she went back to the church so that hopefully no one would notice. Because if we've learned nothing from Candy Montgomery, we know that appearances are important. But on the day that she murdered Betty Gore, she did have to change shoes, though, because the blood covered her rubber flip-flops and the gas to her toe from the axe. She had to put on a thin, kid-style pair of shoes 
instead of the flip-flops that she had been wearing on the morning before she murdered Betty. So it seems pretty evident to me that Candy knew full well that she was tampering and or destroying evidence that may implicate her in Betty's murder. And remember that because it's important for later. There was a good bit of evidence that was tampered with or disrupted by neighbors, bystanders walking through this crime scene, and the Wiley police wasn't equipped to handle a crime scene, especially of this magnitude, and they knew it. The small utility closet where Betty was found was only about 12 foot long by 6 foot wide, and the utility closet is where Betty and Alan kept their washer and dryer, their extra deep freezer, and another small cabinet that held a few odds and ends, some of the kids' toys, and it's also where they kept their dog's food and water bowl. So, Wiley Police Department called in Dr. Irving Stone, who was usually just an advisor in cases like this, where forensic evidence needed to be handled precisely. Dr. Stone worked with the Institute of Forensic Sciences in the Dallas, Texas area at the time. Dr. Stone also wouldn't normally be the one to analyze an entire crime scene and each individual piece of evidence. Normally, he would just look through it and help analyze it, but in this case, since Betty's murder was the first murder in Wiley, Texas in 25 years, and since the entire police department was built up of a total of four officers and a chief of police, they knew that the handling of evidence and the lack of experiment in handling a murder case was one that they weren't going to be able to handle on their own, hence why they called Dr. Stone in to help. But Dr. Stone went through each inch of this small utility closet and the rest of the house collecting evidence for six straight hours. He was known for his amazing sleuthing skills and was basically the MacGyver of putting together crime scene evidence to prove a case. Dr. Stone was able to find one bloody fingerprint of a thumb inside the freezer of the small utility closet, but it was 1980 and DNA was still young. There were only a few ways to lift an exact match to a fingerprint without disturbing it back then, and normally it would be done with chemicals, but those weren't exactly available to Wiley PD because, like I mentioned, there hadn't been a murder in 25 years, so Wiley Police Department did not have access to these chemicals. So, since that wasn't exactly an option, Dr. Stone instructed one of the crime scene photographers to take a very clearly focused picture of the bloody thumbprint. Unfortunately, the photographer was almost out of film and was only able to get one very clear shot of the thumbprint. The axe that had been used to kill Betty was left behind at the crime scene, and investigators had also been able to find one clear shoe print on the floor. The footprint was much smaller than the average man-sized foot, and the piece on the floor was actually cut out to preserve the footprint that had been left behind in blood. Since Betty's hands had been bagged as evidence separately from her body, when the forensic team found the end of a broken fingernail laying in the carpet of the living room, they just kind of assumed that it was Betty's fingernail and that her fingernail had been broken during the fight. The piece of fingernail was also placed in a small evidence bag and taken in. And the only problem with this is that the fingernail, among many other pieces of evidence, had already been touched by police and even by neighbors' bare hands and moved from their original places, furthermore damaging the integrity of this evidence. It was obvious that whoever had murdered Betty had tried to clean the crime scene up and probably gave up once they realized that there was just too much blood and that it wasn't going to clean up easily. Naturally, being the husband, Alan was looked into despite his rock-solid alibi of being out of town. During the questioning, Alan told investigators about a one-night stand that Betty had had a few years back with another man. But Alan claimed that he had always been faithful to his wife. And on June 16, 1980, Alan, their church family, and Betty's family and friends from back in Kansas all attended her funeral services, Candy included in this list of friends that showed up to grieve the loss of their friend. Alan knew that the police would have to look deeper into him just because he was the closest person to Betty, and he had actually started feeling guilty about the fare that he had been having with Candy once he attended the funeral services of his wife Betty. So Alan called the police department and basically told him that he had lied before, that he had also been unfaithful to Betty, that he had been having an affair with Betty's friend from church, Candy Montgomery. 
He made sure to tell them that the affair with Candy had been over for more than six months now, though. And after Alan had talked to the police about the affair with him and Candy, his daughter Alyssa was just talking about all the things that she had done at Miss Candy's house for the last few days, because remember, Alyssa had stayed with Candy even a few days after Betty's death. And Alyssa mentioned that Miss Candy had dropped her, Jenny, and Ian off at Vacation Bible School, but that she had left and she was gone for a little while and that she even missed the puppet show before she came back to church after she dropped them off that morning. So Alan went to the police department to give them Alyssa's recollection of what had happened that day. So their next stop would be to question Candy, with her being Alan's ex-lover. She may have a motive, and a motive was one thing that the police couldn't seem to figure out. Betty was a quiet, polite, keep-to-herself kind of girl, and she just didn't seem to have any enemies. So when Candy came down to the station, investigators went through what seemed to be a pretty routine and friendly line of questioning. They asked her about her day, and she gave them the whole, my watch died after I left Betty's, so when I got to Target, I noticed that it was dead, so I didn't even go in, I just went right back to the church thing. They asked if Candy would be willing to give her fingerprints since it was a routine thing for them to get everyone's fingerprints who would have been inside Betty's house, you know, to rule them out. And Candy agreed. They then asked Candy what shoes she had been wearing on the day that Betty died, and she told them that she had been wearing her blue kid-type, canvas-type sneakers, which would later come back to bite her. Candy was told that she was free to go, and if they needed anything else, that they know where to find her. But during the questioning, they noticed that a lot of Candy's nails weren't exactly in perfect condition like the rest of them were. There were a few broken nails. And the police also found a broken sunglass lens in the middle of the crime scene at Betty's house. Oddly enough, it was these same type of sunglasses that Candy was known to wear, which is not a good look for Candy so far. But during the police questioning Candy, they had actually asked her to take a polygraph test, and she denied. Which, never take a polygraph. I don't care if you didn't do it. Don't do it. It's a trick. So, one of the officers just flat out asked Candy, Did you kill Betty Gore? And Candy denied that, too. But she didn't get super upset or hysterical. She wasn't angry for them making this accusation. She just simply said, No, she didn't kill Betty. And the way that she answered them so calm and calculated made them a little suspicious. The autopsy was done on Betty, and it showed that she had been struck 41 times with an axe, and that 28 of those strikes were to her face and head. And with such a brutal and personal way to murder someone with an axe, the investigators were fairly certain that Betty knew her attacker, and that she likely invited him into her home, which is why there were no signs of forced entry, which also doesn't look great for Candy. Once Candy left from the police department, she called a friend from church who was a lawyer named Don Crowder. Don wasn't a criminal attorney because Don handled mostly civil litigation cases and Candy was so damn good at convincing herself of her own lies that she honestly didn't think that she needed a defense attorney. And I'm not sure how you get that deranged, but here we are. Don Crowder met with Candy and Pat and Don let them know that in order for their conversations to be covered with confidentiality that he would need a check in order to be on retainer. Pat wrote down a check for $100. Now that Candy had obtained a lawyer and the case was growing statewide attention, reporters and onlookers alike were showing up at the Gores' house in the front yard, and those same reporters and onlookers were also starting to show up at the Montgomery house too. Pat did what Pat always did with Candy, and he just stood by her and proclaimed her innocence. Friends from church would send greeting cards to Pat and Candy to let them know that they were thinking about them and praying for them, And nobody except the police thought that Candy could be the one responsible for Betty's murder. Candy was a tiny woman, and she was very friendly, and everybody just seemed to love her. So she couldn't have axed a woman to death 41 times, right? No, not Candy. But finally, during a confidential meeting with her lawyer, Don Crowder, Candy confessed to the murder of Betty Gore. Don and Candy had met up to talk about the case at Don's house, Remember, he was a friend from church, so this isn't as weird as it seems. And Don asked if maybe Candy had walked in on Alan doing something to Betty, and maybe she just lost it. And Candy assured him that she knew that Alan hadn't killed Betty. So Don asked how she could be so sure, and Candy just simply replied, because I did it. I'm sure Don had to have been in a pure state of shock hearing this from Candy, because Don went to church with Candy, and she was one of the highest lay people at their church. She was friends with everybody. 
And she had just confessed to Don that she murdered Betty Gore with an axe of all things. After Don and Candy talked some more about what had actually happened that day, Don urged Candy not to tell her husband Pat because Candy let Don know that if Pat found out that he would likely go to the police and tell them everything. So now she's purposely lying to her husband who has already apologized for her having an affair, forgiven her for that, and is now standing right by her side as the police build a whole-ass murder case against her. Not just that, but a murder case for killing the wife of the same man that she had had an affair with. Pat was way too good of a husband to Candy, and I think we can all agree on that. After Candy confessed to Don all of the different things that had happened inside of Betty's house on that morning, Don called junior attorney Rob Udishin to tell him that they were going to use self-defense to help Candy get away with murder. After this, the police were able to finally match up the print to somebody. That bloody thumbprint was a match to Candy. Shocker, I know. And with this being all over every newspaper, plastered on the front that said that they had found a match to the print that matched a woman in Wiley. The police were actually nice enough to give the junior attorney a call and give him a little heads up that they were going to arrest Candy. This junior attorney, Rob, was able to help Candy get a secure bond, and Rob let officers know that Candy would be there to turn herself in shortly. When Candy and Rob finally arrived at the courthouse, there was a media frenzy waiting for them outside. Almost like somebody had tipped off to reporters that she would be there to turn herself in. Hmm, wonder where they heard that from. And on June 27, 1980, Candy Montgomery was arrested and charged for the murder of Betty Gore. I don't think Candy's attorney, Don Crowder, thought that things would go this far. I think he initially just took this case to help a friend from church, and then he got pulled into the spotlight, and I think he even kind of liked the spotlight. Candy's attorney, Don Crowder, seemed to be willing to do whatever it took to win this murder trial for Candy. He even went so far as to give media and reporters false information to try to catch the district attorney off guard. He did this so much so that the judge presiding over the trial, Judge Tom Ryan, placed a gag order on everybody involved in this case. Don broke this gag order and was arrested and was made to serve one day in jail and pay a $100 fine as well. But this entire trial was full of schemes and nonsense just like this. Just like when Don, a few weeks before the trial started and after the jury selection, did a TV interview, which is when Don Crowder was made to serve a day in jail and was given the $100 fine. Candy's lawyer Don already felt like the judge was completely biased and kind of knew exactly what he was doing. Especially when Don and Candy stood in a courtroom alone waiting for the judge and everyone else involved in this case, When the judge came out of the chambers is when the gag order was processed, but this was before the gag order had been set. Judge Ryan and everyone else except for Don Crowder and Candy came out of the judge's chambers to declare that they would be having a hearing to determine if Candy's bond was still sufficient or not. Don was pretty pissed, and rightfully so, because at this point, Don Crowder had absolutely no idea what was going on, and he wasn't prepared for this in any way, shape, or form. They had been there for the gag order to be set, but not to discuss the sufficiency of Candy's bond. It was a Friday evening, and Candy's defense were not at all prepared. And it had something to do with the paperwork that Candy had given to the bondsman that they used Pat and Candy's house as collateral, not being proper paperwork even though they had given the judge the exact same paperwork from the exact same bondsman that was used all the time at the Collin County Courthouse. And this just made it so Candy was then rearrested, even though everything was actually in order and her bond was actually paid and everything was fine with it. The gag order was also put into place at the proceeding, so this meant that Don couldn't go to the media or the newspapers to even tell them that Candy's constitutional rights were being played with. So... He does the next best thing. Don files a $1.5 million civil lawsuit against the judge and everyone else involved in this case. And he did this because even though he was under a gag order with Candy's case, these filings would have been public record and the media would be able to find it and still run it in the public papers to make people in the public aware of what was going on. And it worked. The rumor mill was hard at work with headlines reading that there was a corrupt judge overseeing Candy's case, which caused a media circus. 
Candy stayed in jail for about a week before being released again. Candy's jury selection started on October 22nd of 1980, and most of the courtroom was completely shocked when Don Crowder stood in front of a pool of potential jurors and said, quote, On June 13th, Candy Montgomery killed Betty Gore. She did so with an axe, and she did so in self-defense. The homicide was justified. We have quite a story to tell. Miss Montgomery will take the stand, and she intends to testify, end quote. So Don is basically laying it all out for any potential jurors, and I'm sure that they were all at least familiar with this case, especially being that the change of venue that Don had tried to get for Candy in her trial had been denied. This was a tiny town, and people do more talking about each other's business than they do about their own lives. The jury would be made up of three men and nine women. Don Crowder was Candy's lawyer, and on the first day of trial, Candy's lawyer said that she was pleading self-defense since Betty had initiated the altercation by coming at her first. So I guess we're just going to forget about the other four blows by the axe. I'm sure that one swing would have stopped Betty dead in her tracks if she was actually attacking Candy in a fit of rage like Candy claimed. So the massive overkill was just, mm, I don't know, to make sure that Betty couldn't get up and try to fight her again? How do you even call beating someone with a three-foot axe 41 times a self-defense case? I'm not sure, but they did the damn thing, though. When Candy's trial started, the courthouse that normally held approximately 200 people was completely full every single day of this trial. Every seat in that courtroom was completely filled with people, and there were actually people that were turned away from being able to come in and watch the trial just because there weren't enough seats. This just wasn't something that happened in Wiley, Texas. People were amazed that the sweet and loving candy that they all knew and loved could even be the same woman that had axed another woman more than 40 times to death. During the trial that lasted eight days, Don Crowder had candy put under hypnosis three different times, and during these hypnosis sessions is when candy supposedly unlocked a suppressed childhood memory. This childhood memory that she had suppressed for all of these years was one of her mother shushing her in an emergency room, which is what triggered her to go into a blind fit of rage and kill Betty to start with. Because that makes sense. And during this time, Candy also attended three different therapy sessions, pulling in more of her childhood trauma memories that had been suppressed. Alan also testified to the fact that he and Candy did in fact have an affair, but that they had both agreed to amicably end the affair, that they agreed that they would remain friends afterwards, and that he couldn't think of a reason that Candy would want to hurt Betty at all. Psychologist Fred Fazen testified that Candy had suffered from a disorder known as dissociative reaction, which is when Betty shushed Candy, causing her to snap. It triggered Candy from a suppressed memory from her childhood from the time in the emergency room with her mom. Candy also testified in her own defense, recounting all of the events that happened in that day and in what order they happened. And this disassociative reaction disorder was the way that the defense would explain away the overkill. And Candy herself said during testimony that she actually didn't stop swinging the axe until she reached a point of utter exhaustion. There had also been a little girl by the name of Tina that lived just a few doors away from the Gore's house. Five-year-old Tina, who lived near Betty and Alan Gore, had seen Candy leaving Betty's house around 11 a.m. on the day that Betty was murdered, which is the same time that the puppet show at the church was supposed to start, which Candy missed. Tina went to knock on the door of the Gore's house, and after she saw Candy pulling out of the driveway in her station wagon, she assumed that Betty, Alyssa, and the baby Bethany were home and inside, or they wouldn't have visitors. Tina knocked on the door to see if Alyssa could come out and play with her, and even though Tina knocked a few times, she never got an answer. There had also been a delivery man that had knocked on the house of the Gores at about 12 p.m. This delivery man could hear Bethany crying, but no one ever came to the door. So there were a few different people that could confirm the time that Betty was alive during certain time frames of that day. Candy's trial lasted for about eight days and Candy was eventually acquitted on all of the charges and was free to go. Even though, according to the pathologist, Betty was hit with the three-foot axe 41 times, and she was alive for all of those except for the very last swing of the axe. 
Betty somehow managed to survive being hit repeatedly by a three-foot axe 40 times before her body finally gave in on the last swing. When this verdict was read, the courtroom went completely silent, and the jurors had to be walked to their vehicles for fear of being harmed for acquitting Candy. As Candy left the courtroom, she was called all sorts of names, and people were outraged. Don Crowder's wife, Carol Parker, says that after Candy's trial finally came to a close, that the couple were receiving death threats daily. Don Crowder even says that even all these years later, that the faces of Betty's family members still haunts him just from the way that they looked when they heard that the jury had acquitted Candy on all charges. Candy and Pat attempted to go on about their normal lives. The couple sold their house and moved to Georgia, but they later divorced. And when I started researching this case, I was completely shocked to my core when I saw that Candy had actually become a licensed professional counselor where she is helping troubled teens and young adults and that she got her license in 2009. Who in the hell is letting Candy Montgomery counsel their kids? She does go by her maiden name now, though, now going by Candy Wheeler again, which kind of makes me want to Google every professional that I see. But we'll move on from that. Alan went on to marry a neighbor by the name of Elaine Williams, who Betty and Alan had known before Betty's death from church, and Alan and Elaine also moved from their house in Wiley. But instead of getting the kind, loving stepmom that would raise them and love them like their own, Betty's kids got stuck with Elaine, who was awful, according to Alyssa and Bethany Gore, when they did later interviews. Alyssa and Bethany gave an interview on the 30th anniversary of their mom's murder, and they said that both their dad and their stepmom Elaine were horrible to them after Betty's death. Alyssa said that Elaine, who was her stepmom, actually forced her to read the book Evidence of Love when she was just 10 years old. This book is where I got a lot of my research, and this book goes into great detail about the affair, the planning that went into it, and even some of the sexual stuff that took place. But it was even more in-depth and detailed about how Betty was murdered and Alyssa was being forced to read this by her stepmom at just 10 years old. Alyssa was even asked questions and made to answer and give summaries after she read each chapter, so that Elaine could make sure that she had actually read it all the way through. So, extremely unhealthy and even abusive. Alyssa and Bethany went on to stay with Elaine and Alan, who they claim would hold food from them and make them stand in tubs of ice as punishment when they misbehaved. Thank God, though, Betty's parents were able to get full custody of both Alyssa and Bethany, where they moved to Kansas and were raised in a loving and more considerate household with Betty's parents. Both Alyssa and Bethany went on to graduate high school, and their relationship with their dad, Alan, was almost non-existent, from what I can tell, for quite a while. They seemed to be working on it and trying to make things better and having a more healthy relationship now, so that's always good. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who reached out to me about my father-in-law being in the hospital. You guys are amazing. I was not expecting that kind of turnout. Everyone offered to DoorDash food, send money for Cash App, for gas. I mean, there were just people from everywhere offering to help in any way that they could. I love you guys. That was amazing. I'm sorry this episode's late. I have been recording it literally minute by minute for the last week, and it's finally done. So, now that he's out of the hospital, I can say this with confidence. Let's do it again. Same time, same place, next Wednesday. I'll see you then. But until then, we are finally, finally, finally on Apple Podcasts, where you are able to rate and leave a review. And if you haven't done so already, that would just make my entire week. I love reading them. And if you're not already, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at murdered underscore mama. And I'm on Facebook. I don't remember the name. Just search Mama Murdered a Podcast and I'm sure I'll pop up. But seriously, thank y'all so much. I'll catch you next week. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.